Hello and welcome everybody to the Ryerson University Ted Rogers School of Management International Sports Business Spotlight, where we continue our series with top leaders in the sports business, focusing on the future of the global sports industry, digging into industry trends, and hearing some great stories and lessons in leadership along the way. My name is Chris Schufelt. I'm the Vice President of Business Operations at Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, and I'll be your host for today's session. We continue our spotlight series with Chad Biagini, president of Nolan Partners Executive Search Firm. So when I initially contemplated uh, building out the speakers for this podcast series, it was important that we had a, a real international scope and really got a great understanding of what's happening in the industry. And naturally the consulting firm that, that Chad works with certainly has that, uh, that great breadth uh, of knowledge across the sports industry and specifically across the last 12 months of the pandemic has had conversations spanning the globe that are gonna provide some real insight into what's happening out there in the world of sports. So first of all, welcome Chad Biagini to, uh, to our podcast. Thank you, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for including me. Nice to Absolutely. see you today. Absolutely, good to see you. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna set the table with, uh, with your bio so everybody knows uh, who you are and what your firm does. And then we'll get right into uh, some questions. So Chad brings 10 years of experience in executive search, representing a wide range of entertainment and sports clients, including Ultimate Fighting Championship, WWE, US Olympics, and teams across Major League Baseball, the NHL, Major League Soccer, and the NFL. He also has global experience with a number of different clubs, placing executives at global soccer clubs like Chelsea, Juventus, and Paris Saint-Germain. Chad earned his Executive Masters of Science from the London School of Economics and conducted his undergraduate studies at Harvard University. He serves on the board of the World Football Summit where he chairs the selection of the Football Executive of the Year. So Chad, um, you've had tons of experience across the globe. You're speaking with you know, owners every single day. So we're really excited to, uh, to dive in and, and understand what's going on. But first I wanna to touch on, you know, that, that um, crazy day, which for us was, was March the 12th, right? March 11th, the sports world kind of comes to a halt. The NBA um, postpones a game. Rudy Gobert tests positive uh, for COVID-19. And for us, the next day it meant we shut down Leafs practice. TFC practice was shut down. There was a lot of decisions and and challenges, you know, shortly thereafter. So I'm curious, you know, in your world and, and the company that you work within, what that day was like, or if it was a, you know, a, a different set of sequences, but uh, from a leadership standpoint, how did that roll out for you? It was a, a day we'll, we'll all remember forever, isn't it? It started a little bit earlier for us, Chris. So I was in London, March 1st through 8th, I, I believe were my exact days. And that trip was supposed to be all of the UK, Italy, and Germany. Uh, we ended up canceling meetings in Germany, uh, probably the fourth that was supposed to be scheduled the fifth, because we're starting to see the world unwind. And, and our clients are, are all over the globe. Right? We've done surges in six different continents, and even some clubs are owned by international owners themselves. So you, you look at major leagues and owners from Russia and China and Abu Dhabi, so other areas of the world started shutting down. And I remember around March 5th, my CEO, Paul, saying, Chad, in the next two weeks, all of your schools will be locked down. This is very serious. And I'm thinking, there's no chance our schools are going to be locked down in America. Uh, lo and behold, it happened faster than his prediction. But he had already started seeing other areas of the world kind of coming in on itself. Um, I had a lunch on the 6th or 7th. Somebody flew in from Germany and he said there were three other people on his flight, three people on a flight from Germany to London Heathrow. And that just doesn't happen. So you, you start to have this eerie feeling something's taking place. Uh, by the time the NBA shut down, it, it probably made it most real for North America. The NBA is iconic part of culture, pop culture, uh, just the media presence you knew it was serious then, um, but it, it was a day we'll always remember. Then as a business, you're starting to say, how, what is this? How do we pivot? What do we prepare for? We didn't have a manual on the shelf that says what to do in a global pandemic and how to operate it. So 
just this big stop moment to say, let's figure ourselves out. And you, you can imagine in our world, our searches are all different stages. We had a couple of projects where they were ready to make an offer. Do we <laughs> make an offer? We had others where they signed off two days prior to launch a new search. Do, do we still send invoices on those? <laughs> right? Just this whole big question mark of, of what will the business be? Um, and it, it made us have to do a lot of looking internally to say, okay, how do we prepare for this? How long will it be? What, what information do we have at our fingertips? What can we learn from others? So, wow, right? Wow, what a, what a strange time to be in business. Yeah, I remember um, one of the first things Bill Manning, our president, said to us was, uh, he said, Shuey, there's no playbook for this. We're going to figure this out together and we're going to communicate and we're going to lead our people and, and make sure that, yeah. that the people are, are put first. And that's been, you know, a, a real, um, it, it's been amazing from a culture standpoint that that's been the mindset. And I, I've heard that from a lot of leaders that we've talked to in, in this podcast. It's been about people and that's the main thing uh, through this. So, yeah, your your um your discussions at the top level in sports organizations across the across the globe with ownership specifically. Let's let's talk about that. Um, most sports teams are owned by billionaires, very wealthy individuals who are running businesses. Some are making good money and, and profiting during during the pandemic. Some aren't. Right. It, it, this is a very tragic. Um, pandemic for our industry specifically. Your conversations at the ownership level, how, how are those playing out? And what are, what are some of those insights specifically at that level that you're hearing about sports in general? Yeah, it's a, a wide range, Chris. I mean, why do owners own teams in the first place is one of the questions that we try to dissect as we're working on a project. Because for some, it is the profitability of the franchise where, where some are profitable. Others, it's the long-term asset growth. Others, this is their train set. They love it, right? It's their toy and, and to others, it's a gift to the community and, and they know how much it brings the community together. And, and so it's, it's more of a benevolent look. Some it's geopolitical relations, right? Why, why do people own teams versus other assets? Uh, and I'd say they responded differently based off of why they own a team. And even now as they're looking at, at rebound, rebounding, how they approach a rebound, I'd say some of the general themes of it all are what, what got us from 2010 to 2020 is probably a different playbook than gets us from 2021 20, into a future. Uh, marketing is a big conversation point right now. Many of these organizations are used to doing a very good job selling tickets to fans. This is different now. A lot of times you're not bringing people into a venue. Most venues are still closed or, or limited capacity. That might extend for a period of time. And so how do you engage with and provide value to all of your various stakeholders in a way you're not used to doing it as commonly? And, and certainly some teams have been thinking about that for a long time, but, but many haven't. And so you've got these groups saying, is the team of people we have now the right people to get us into the next wave uh, how do we evaluate and measure new sets of KPIs? How do we even look back at this last year and say, did we do a good job responding to this? Because there is, there is certainly this period where I'd say owners had a lot of grace for their CEOs saying no one's ever gotten through this. On the other side of this, we're going to find out you know, which athletes continued training during, during an off season versus those that went on vacation during an off season. And uh, similarly, on the business side, right, you'll see who did a really great job connecting an employee base, growing, protecting customers, winning with fans, and, and who did less than a stellar job. Uh, so there's certainly this looking in at an organization saying we, we need to be prepared to rebound rapidly. Some of that starts now with new hiring and new strategic plans. But do we have the right people to do that in the first place? is a, a big discussion point, owners the world over. Yeah, so, so I feel like, you know, and reflecting back at our organization, we had, um, I feel like we were down the road from an innovation standpoint and we had some of those building blocks in place. I feel like we had a bit of a head start on what some of our um, counterparts may have had, whether it's across the globe or, or here in North America. Are you finding that those organizations that had to really kick it into that next level are they getting up to speed pretty quickly? Are they, are they dealing with change in, in the pace that you think they need to? Um, 
you know, will they get to a point where they can drive those other revenues that they need to ultimately to, to stay afloat, to, to keep it going? I think many are. You know what COVID taught so many of us was humility. We don't have all the answers ourselves. And I've never, I can't remember a time in my career, I, I started work in 2003. I can't remember a time where I've seen so much collaboration across industries, right? Where a CEO will host a round table and bring in an outside thought leader on a topic and say, you teach us. And next week I'll teach your round table with your colleagues. And so where it wouldn't have been uncommon for a business, and in this case, a sports team, looking at themselves and saying, how can we be better? And maybe asking a couple peer organizations, how can we be better? This is one of the first times they've brought sponsors in and said, how are you guys doing this? How are you addressing this? What can we learn from you? So there's been a lot of sharing of information, ideas, best practices across an industry. And, and that started with many saying, I don't have the answers myself, or, or maybe, maybe I do, but I'd like to check and compare those with other people. So we're, we're hiring a lot right now. And in many of these roles, these are organizations with owners that have been around for a long time. This, is, this isn't the new private equity set of owners who are coming in who absolutely will make changes. Th these are people who own teams for 10, 20, 40 years who are making changes. And a lot of those changes are built upon them getting advice from others and saying, you need to do things differently than you were doing it before. Uh, and I'm seeing a lot pivot well. I've, I've been really impressed with organizations recognizing now is a time for change. It's the right thing to do by the business. It's the right thing to do to preserve most of the other jobs that have remained within the business. And, and it's the right thing to do for fans as, as they deserve the best experience from this. It's interesting in the past, we've seen a lot of you know, CEO collaboration on different foundations or charitable work, but, but to a point where they get in a room and talk about their own business and how they can evolve and change and innovate. Your firm has done some work in, in uh, that collaboration and bringing those groups together. What, uh, what, what can you say that you've learned most about those sessions and, and uh, the responses that you've had? Yeah, le leadership is lonely. Uh, it just is. You've got a lot of pressure of an organization on your shoulders. People expect you to have the answers. You don't always have the answers. And I've, I've been just so pleased with and, and inspired by how open executives have been with one another sharing. So we host a series of roundtables where we'll bring all CROs together or all CEOs together or all heads of HR together. And we'll usually do them in eight to 12 people. So it's small enough, intimate enough to talk. And people have been open books, open books sharing how it's affected their own mental health, open books on what they didn't do well, that they wish they would have known and learned from. Uh, so what, what have I picked up from it? Picked up probably more than ever how important it is just to admit you don't have to have the answers. And, and in fact, your, your staff appreciates when you admit that oftentimes, at, at, least in, at least in the Western world where power distance is lower. And, and what I mean by that is there's open door policies in, in the Western world. And, and a lot of times there's not, a, there's not a requirement to go through 12 layers to get something up to the top. Um, in that world, admitting that you might not be an expert yet, it, it works well. Your employees appreciate, they often bring a better perspective. Your colleagues and peers appreciate. And, and those who tried to solve this on their own and, and didn't participate in forums like that, they, they experienced just their own viewpoints and their own viewpoint might not have always been right. Yeah, I think it's tremendous. And, and I've heard that over and over again in these sessions. Um, you know, one of our first uh, session was with Stacy Allister and the first, that's what she said, you know, and she's a tremendous leader. Uh, and she's like, I needed help. I needed to be talking to all of my counterparts in all these different leagues and tournaments, et cetera. So that, that openness to share has certainly been, uh, has been great. Myself in, in the work across major league soccer has, has been this, has been the same thing and everybody's been open. So uh, it's a family that has come together certainly during this, this tough time. So we're seeing the evolution of different types of roles in, in sports and entertainment. And in our organization, you know, a, a couple of years ago, we ended up hiring uh, a person to lead our security group, but she had come from the airport industry, the aviation industry, where she had dealt with so much health and regulation and everything you can imagine dealing with at an airport. Lo and behold, turns out she's been 
one of the most important assets for our organization leading through this pandemic because she has taken over health and safety as well as government relations and regulations dealing with all the chief medical officers within our province or, or country as well. So uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that type of a role and is that something that will stick moving forward in, in the significance of that role? It's a critical role. Which organizations will bring it in-house versus which ones insource it? Uh, that, that'll depend on the size and structure of their organization. I, I don't foresee many teams that only play 8, 10, 12 home games uh, bringing a person in full-time solely with that skill set. But they'll probably invest a lot into outside thought coming in with a skill set there. Um, we, there will be an expectation from fans that there is more thought around safety and wellness. It's going to, at the same time, cause marketing to have to ask new questions. How do we do those things without losing the romance of coming to a sports game? Because it, we, we go there for fun. We go there to forget about our problems in life, right? We go there to, to live a human experience. And so there is a balance of saying, if you have too much of that safety and protection and guardrails, does it affect the romance? And so it's gonna cause departments to collaborate with one another who might not have had to collaborate in the past. Uh, digital innovations becoming a huge thing right now, Chris. Many sports organizations view digital as a function of marketing. And sure, marketing has a digital element to it, but so does our accounting software. So does our talent acquisition tools. So do all of our business metrics. And a long time, I think sports organizations expected their head coach to be an expert on what technology he or she wanted to use. And they expected their GM to be the expert. They expected CFO to be expert, et cetera. And now there's this rise of a role where it's not IT, it's not keeping systems online and updating computers and, and changing passwords, right? It's someone coming in saying, our world's moving really fast. Digital investments are expensive, not just the cost of the product, but the cost of implementation and learning. So are we getting the right tools? Are we using them in the right way? Uh, and then beyond that, just things around cybersecurity and, and other areas of a business that we didn't all go through before that that's not going to go away that will be a role you guys have one we've done that a few times recently within nba within european football that that will become a very common role and that's one i believe should be brought in-house full-time not not outside consultant because it's every department's constantly changing and to have that skill set it, it'll be new to an industry and that role and i know from our experience that's not somebody that's traditionally been found in a sports organization. I'm assuming your searches for that role are spanning different businesses. You know, our CTO, Hamza, you know, he, he has come from food service and digitized food service and drove billions of dollars of revenue. You know, he would see himself as a revenue guy and a technology guy, right? So it's, it's an interesting yeah. type of position that's being brought into that, uh, into the industry that's going to, you know, hopefully insulate not just your key, you know, it's not just your key sources of revenue anymore. There's this, there's this other bucket. One thing I wanted to, to see if it was common across some of the other, the other searches you've done with this role, the way, the way that uh, we've been coached or thought about this over the last number of years is there's an element of this role that both functions with the business side, but we can, we can actually use this role to help us win and help us win games. And whether it's a, you know, we call it a sports performance lab, but it's a direct pipeline to whether it's our hockey office, our basketball office, or our soccer office from our digital team and a, and a team of project managers that can help solve some of their, some of the, the hockey offices challenges, if you will. And what does a coach need to win and what do they need to measure? And it's been, uh, it's been pretty amazing to see some of that work being done. So is that quite common now you're seeing in that role? Absolutely, that there is an expectation they're supporting the sporting side of an operation as well. Uh, and it's a couple of things, right? It's absolutely what technologies are we using, but it's, it's a role that requires a lot of critical thinking because you have to peel back the data and make sense of the data, right? And in its simplest form, you look at companies out there who are noticing someone has a 46% shot accuracy. Well, what if all those shots weren't equal opportunity shots. Some of those were heavily guarded. Some of those weren't guarded, right? Let's peel back the data to say, well, how many shots did they score when they were wide open? Oh, it was 75%. If we can get this person more open, 
excellence news. How many, how many were being covered by two people versus one person? And so that type of information that machine learning and technology and algorithms might be able to identify faster to provide the right information to a coach, a GM, head of performance, so that they can make quicker decisions and, and not have to watch 60 minutes of tape to find all the pick and rolls. The technology does it for them, and, and very much so. This person having an ability to navigate across both business and performance to, to have competitive advantage everywhere. You know, and it's, it's not uh, an inexpensive endeavor for an owner owner either. If you're really going to build that as a core function of your business, it's, it's not one role, right? It, it's a team. Right. It's, it's, it's a new team of, of people from, from what I've seen across the industry. So it's a real commitment to thinking differently uh, as we move forward, which, which is almost going to be required. So I wanted to pivot a little bit and to talk about um, leadership from maybe some of those core functions of, of the business, because what I've been able to witness over the last 12 months is the sales leader's role has become that much more difficult. They are now, they are now worried about, yes, we still need to try and sell and retain our business, right? So they've got that revenue target that they got to figure out. But in often cases, as is our organization or other multi-sport you know, sports organizations, they've got large teams of people that are there to, that are there typically to, to sell tickets. What I've been able to witness over the last 12 months is nothing short of remarkable from a sales leadership standpoint, because not only are they worried about a target, they're worried about cheerleading, making sure people are, are in good spirits, are ready to get up and, and sell in a very tough environment to the extent that they can and prepare ourselves for, for the following years. So that's what I've been able to, to witness from a, a leadership standpoint. And I'm curious as you place people in these types of roles, is that something now more than before? Or has that always been a core competency of what you needed from a, a sales leader? Yeah, the leadership is so critical. Sports industry for a long time would promote the highest functional performer into a management role, but that doesn't actually mean they're the best manager. And then oftentimes the best manager would get promoted into the best leadership role, but that doesn't mean they're the best leader, right? Leaders should be strong at vision setting and strategy and culture. Well, management is often more process and systems and structure. And, and so just this importance of seeing how someone has adapted their own careers and, and evolved themselves along the way. Uh, COVID was, was a big challenge for sales departments. Sales departments are used to winning. They're used to, to ringing the bell, so to speak. I read an article probably about two months into the pandemic that was talking about drug sniffing dogs and bomb sniffing dogs and how those dogs every two or three days will find that the, the owner of the dog will let them find fake drugs or fake bombs because the dog needs to know it's accomplishing its goals. So it makes the dog happy and the dog thinks I'm doing what I've been trained to do. Uh, and I think there's a lot of those parallels in us as humans, right? When you're used to selling four or five times a day, four or five times a week, and you don't sell anything for three, four months because of outside circumstances, what that does to morale is significant. And for leaders to be able to find other ways to show their team, hey, you're, you're creating worth and value in a different way. As a result, we're going to measure you in a different way through this. And, and I certainly saw many leaders change what the KPIs they were looking for. Instead of perhaps the outputs, 600,000 in sales this quarter, it was the inputs, 50 phone calls a day. And they went back to some of those things. They let's measure shorter term accomplishments because we know those work in the long run, but we might not sell anything for six months. So let's, let's get rid of that output without losing the input. So good leaders did find ways to measure differently, to give that, that mechanism back to the team of, hey, I'm, I'm achieving, I'm doing well, especially those who are motivated by wins. It's why video games are so successful, right? You, you get a chance to say, I did a good job, next. I lost, <laughs> next. And, and have that, that immediate kind of pattern back to you. You know, we're, we're used to in our industry, um, you know, selling something and, and you know, tickets, for example, it's, it's transactional in that there's payment right away and you get moving and, you know, you move through the system for, for the most part. And we've had to pivot and, you know, no risk selling, right? 
if we're, we're, not, if we're not playing or you need to, or something happens in your job, like we've had to maneuver and do what some other industries have done in order to, to try and still put up some, some dollars for the future, right? We still need to try and sell as many season tickets as possible. And we've got people employed to do that. So that's been a, a real innovation within our group. And we've seen some really good success along with that sales leadership. So I thought it was important to, uh, to touch on that. So sure. as, if, as if the pandemic wasn't heavy enough, right? In May, we've got the murder of George Floyd and everything that followed. And, you know, it's been, it's been scary watching what's happening in, in the U.S., uh, to be honest, sitting here in, in Canada. And obviously, we've got our, our own challenges and, and problems with systemic racism and, and what we're doing to combat that. But watching what's happening, you know, south of us is, is you know, it's worrisome. So the, the, the sports industry has a voice and a very, very strong voice and a public voice. And what we've seen across teams in the U.S., um, across Canada, is a very um, forward approach from the players, from the organizations about, you know, creating equity um, and celebrating people of all different backgrounds. And I think it's been something that's been really important for our organization specifically. But taking that back into your space, into your role, uh, organizations are starting to think differently about um, ED&I within their, within their work, uh, their workforce, and what that means, both from a, a staffing standpoint, but also from a marketing standpoint and a storytelling standpoint and how they interact with players. So within the last number of months, how has this played out within uh, your organization specifically, the searches you've been on? You know, we've seen a lot of chief diversity officers uh, hired across the leagues, uh, and it's certainly you know a, a massive trend that seems to be uh, continuing. Yeah, absolutely. So to give some context, the last two years we've had more than fifty percent of our placements as either females or executives of color. Uh, so there's a, a huge prioritization across the industry of recognizing the lack of diversity within it. It's always been a, a major priority of ours. And, and these organizations have had to shift where they get talent from sometimes to achieve that, right? If you're looking and you're saying this role requires 15 years of sports finance experience, well, all you do is have to turn back the clock 15 years and say, well, who were the people starting finance jobs then? It was mostly homogenous. So the likelihood of that requirement achieving a diverse outcome is, is minimal. So we, we've helped a lot of these organizations say, do you really need 15 years of sports finance or maybe it's 15 years of finance and, and a passion for sport or, or two years of sport, right? Just changing some of the expectations that, that won't reduce the likelihood of success in the role at all, right? If anything, new perspective can be very beneficial. Uh, and that's, that's been very helpful across the industry as teams and leagues have said, we don't only have to look inside of our own sector for this hire, other sectors might have a more diverse talent pool. Let's be intentional about that. Let's even restructure the role to, to accommodate different experiences and, and different industry success. So that, that's one side of it that I've seen has become a bigger priority for everybody. Uh, the role of a chief diversity officer, a VP of diversity, equity, inclusion has also grown up the priority ranks of organizations. We just wrapped up one within an NFL team we made an offer on one this morning within another NFL team. Um, and that role is, is broader than I think many teams thought it would be. So to start, many organizations viewed that as a function of human resources. How do we promote and hire more individuals from different backgrounds, more females and executives of color? But at the same time, how do we develop them and give them equal opportunity uh, and, and, and celebrate their successes that, that's what many thought the role was. The role's bigger than that though, right? The fan bases of these teams are very diverse. Look, look across North American sport. Women are the ones who buy more tickets than men. And yet it's usually a man selling to a woman. And, and presuming we know, my wife knows a lot more about herself than I do. I try every day to learn more about my wife and be a great husband, but she knows more about herself, right? And so just this recognition that our fan bases are very diverse. We need to be diverse within our organizations to engage them well. And, and how a line or a phrase or a communication platform that might work well with one demographic 
does, doesn't work well with other demographics. And, and we've known this for years, especially on the age side, right? Those 60 plus might not be buying tickets online. They're buying through a phone call, but those younger might be on Facebook. But that there are different behaviors much broader than that as you start to break down demographics and psychographics. That role, you, you pointed out the player side, right? It's the same. The number of times I've heard of players not succeeding because their spouse was unhappy and they probably moved to the wrong neighborhood that wasn't that wasn't as well suited for their family and saying, well, this role should be working with a coach and a GM to be able to understand the family unit. So to me, that is a, a person who is very understanding across an organization. They've got tons of empathy for different life experiences, different backgrounds, different responsibilities of departments and functions. Um, and that person is a change agent, right? They, they help drive change across an organization. HR is an element of that. That role is not an HR only role. That role is a corporate wide, sport wide role. And the organizations that are embracing it, they're doing just an awesome job. Their employees are happy, their fans are happy. And I only see this becoming a bigger priority. A, a few points to, um, to add on to this, cause it's, it's very topical um, for what, what our organization is going through, but what, what I'm seeing as well. Uh, when, when, this mo movement, and I don't know if to call it that, but when we really started to bring into focus uh, diversity in the workplace after after the George Floyd murder, we had a, a day of reflection. And this has just been a level of openness across people in sports, mm -hmm. I find, and in organizations. And we created a safe place to tell, to tell stories, to understand what people had gone through. And when organizations create that type of openness and the ability to listen and learn, for all people, it, it provides such a different perspective of what everybody else has to go through versus hearing it third party. But when you've got, whether it's your team presidents or you know the person that works for you telling you this personal story of what happened to them because of the color of their skin, um, it, it makes you get into their footsteps and understand a little bit, maybe a tiny little bit about what they, what they went through um, and why maybe they have certain perspectives on, on different things. So I know for us, in our organization, that single day that we had, um, there's been many more steps along the way, but that was a really important day for our organization where we all stopped and we stopped working and we listened to six different speakers across the day tell their stories. So I think that's um, that 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 single moment uh, is really important and it's parlayed into new roles in the organization. So you talked about a you know a chief diversity officer and there's there is the HR focusing component, but then that second part is. You know, sport development is also a really interesting one and, and what sports teams obligations are to be developing their the community and providing opportunity for youth, maybe at risk youth. And, you know, I'll use our organization as an example. We've invested a lot of money over the years, but you know what we never really did a great job of is actually talking about it and telling the story and the power of the storytelling behind it is because other organizations should be doing that as well and seeing that right? And the power of the megaphone can certainly help. So we've taken a, an approach where, you know, we're making a, a jump up in our commitment to investing in development of sport in underserved communities, but we're also going to tell the story. So we want other organizations around us, our corporate partners or other sports teams to see that happening. And I think there's a real powerful movement happening uh, right now that's going to benefit um, everybody in society and you know, our community, super diverse community, 50% of the population not born here in, in Canada. Um, and it's going to certainly, certainly help progress the sports, uh, the sports world and, and society. So something I'm, I'm proud of the last, the last 10 months has been great for our organization from, from that standpoint. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. You guys have certainly been leaders there. So I want to touch transition a little bit into the globality of, of your role and talk about some of the other teams that you've, you've worked with. And, you know, and you can tell me I'm wrong, but you know, there's a perspective of the North American sports executive and, and kind of the core functions that, that they're great at and, and what they've done. And then there's this, you know, the European sports executive. Uh, I think over the number of years, it's been, it's been changing and, and shifting as to, you know, what is valued across different parts of the world from, a, from an executive standpoint. But I'd just like to hear from you some of the differences uh, that you've noticed over the years, and maybe if there is a transition happening, or or just to provide and shed some light on that. Sure. So for a long time, the talent on the pitch, rink, court, 
was global. Right? You have players from all over the world come from one area to another area and, and bring a, a skill set, and it made a global competitive talent pool. Uh, we saw about five years ago, when I, when I joined, one of the reasons Paul wanted to launch a North American practice besides just us growing was this recognition that the talent in the business office is relevant around the world also. And, and you weren't seeing a lot of that happening. And, and part of that would just be an NBA team might not know how to measure two different people from cricket and who's better or someone in cricket in South Africa versus somebody in soccer in Switzerland, right? So there wasn't enough knowledge within the hiring organization, nor should it have been, to know how to evaluate that. So they might have gone and hired the more obvious talent. And then equally search firms, right? Most search firms, we're, we're a boutique. We're, we're just under 20 people, which makes us the largest in the world for what we do. That's, that's how niche our sector is. But a lot of the firms we'll compete against are 1,000, 2,000 people. So they're so big, the office in Melbourne works on roles in Melbourne. And the office in Geneva works on roles in Geneva. And the person who's in biotech only does biotech. So even though a team might have hired a global firm, they probably weren't really getting a global team or global knowledge base. They were getting an office. So we, we saw this and said, like, what an opportunity. And others have also started seeing this. And it's been great for the industry because talent should be mobile. And a lot of what we deal with is similar, but there needs to be cultural sensitivities wrapped on that. Um, I've certainly seen people from America go over into Europe and not realize the fan consumes the sport differently. So there might not be as much of an appetite for significant premium from everybody, right? Or, or the fact that this family has had season tickets for a hundred plus years. And it's, it's more of a sense of belonging to the community. you never see a team in another country relocate as an example, but in America, that's, that's normal. That's, that's maybe not normal, but it's, it's more common, right? It's not, it's not a big deal. Nobody's shocked when that happens. So there's a huge need for changing and, and calibrating toward a local culture who the fan is in that culture, who the people are in that culture. Uh, from a skill set kind of standpoint, North America is excellent at ticket sales, maximizing ticket value, understanding the supply and demand of that inventory, and being able to get the most out of that revenue. And as a result, it's a huge portion of the revenue pie of a sports team here. And not just that, all the other areas around it, from the food and beverage to parking, et cetera. Uh, that is part of North American culture to do that, and fans will pay for that more premium experience and, and be part of that. Uh, that is a skill set that can certainly be learned in other areas of the world, but, but not every customer wants that. And we've seen times where an American investor might come over and try an American idea, and it was just rejected because the organ didn't get accepted by the new body, so to speak. Uh, what often is lacked in North America is experience negotiating and selling to dozens of countries, right? sponsors in all different areas of the world. So it wouldn't be uncommon to see a sports team in Vancouver have only Canadian sponsors, despite the fact that the, the population there is incredibly diverse. And, and it, wouldn't be un, it wouldn't be uncommon to see a sports team in LA only having you ask sponsors, despite very diverse. And so there is this big push right now within North America to say, we need to recognize we're becoming global brands. We have some restrictions based off of what our leagues allow us to do and how we use our, our, um, our IP, but that's starting to, to change and leagues are starting to give more flexibility. So if you were to say like, what are two big distinct differences? Europe's great at globalizing, understanding other markets, knowing how to negotiate with other markets, knowing every country does business differently than one another, but they might not be as focused on maximizing every ticket price in the area. And again, the consumers might, might not always want that, but there's an opportunity for improving. And then in the North American side, really great at those pieces and driving ticket value and the most fantastic consumer experiences. When you, you go to a Super Bowl game versus the Champions League final, the premium element of the Super Bowl is so much higher than the Champions League final, but, but I'm sure a lot of the attendees of the Champions League final would have loved that Super Bowl experience, right? So there's, a, there's an opportunity to share and to bring those over. Um, each can learn from one another, and you're starting to see globalization. We did a search years ago for Stacy. You talked about Stacy Allister, where we found her head of officiating 
and we recruited someone from Cricket Australia to be the head of officiating in U.S. tennis. He was the best for the role, despite never working in tennis in his career. Uh, despite everyone's fears, referees or umpires in tennis are not wearing face masks and knee guards like they do in cricket. So he, he knew how to adapt it, right, and, and make it relevant to what the sport was. But it was a role of change management. It was a role of making sure we had the best umpires on planet Earth. And he had done that in cricket in Australia, which was more important than you know, knowing whether to call a ball in or out. Because that wasn't his job. He was managing those people. And uh, it's been a great hire for them. And Sean's been promoted since then and grown into larger roles. And had that search only been North America, it, it wouldn't have had the same outcome. And that, that's a non-commercial example, but you have that. There's lots of people pouring in from scouting and high performance and coaching from other areas of the world because they're looking at North America and saying how exciting this could be. And equally, those markets over there should be looking at North American talent on the performance side and saying you've prevented knee and ankle injuries of basketball players who have higher knee and ankle injuries due, due to height and the way that the sport is and pivoting. Help us make sure our top rugby players don't get injured the same way. It, sh it should be going back the other direction as well, which is exciting for talent because it means that they're not limited to a marketplace. That's, um, that's an awesome answer. And, and I want to parlay that into this next um, discussion on curation of culture within an organization. And, you know, sometimes key executive positions or coaching positions, for example, let's say, um, maybe they move on for different reasons that are, you know, they didn't get fired. They were, they were great at what they do. They're moving on to another role. But the culture is great within an organization. How, how do you go and place somebody knowing that you're looking for the best person specifically for that role, but culture maybe doesn't need to alter or maybe doesn't need to change too much? I think it's a fine balance as to how you place sure. that person into the role. I'm curious as to how you go through the process of, of that understanding what's needed, first of all but then finding the right individual for, for that role. Because oftentimes people, either, whether it's a coaching role or a CEO role, uh, a big executive role, they're used to you know, cultural shifts and changes and, and leadership from, from that level. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's been lots of studies as well, Chris, that show when an organization is very strong already and market leaders, oftentimes it's better to promote from within if you have that bench strength in order to preserve that culture. Uh, the, the studies compared outsiders versus insiders, and insiders usually did better. When insiders failed, they failed miserably. So it wasn't a little bit of a fail. Where outsiders, when they failed, failed a little bit. Uh, and, and why miserably? Probably because they weren't onboarded the same way an outsider would have been onboarded. The KPIs might not have been as obvious. They maybe gave too much, too much grace because they knew the person. Uh, but when you already have a high-performing culture, you want to preserve that and protect that at all costs. So part, part of our job as a search firm and, and part of the hiring organization's job needs to be transparent up front with talent too, right? At leadership roles, most talent isn't desperate for a new job. They, they should likely be happy enough in their current job and enjoy it. So you're, you're on the front end being very clear what you're selling. And this isn't a transformation project. This isn't tear everything apart. Talent who likes those projects will, will usually select themselves out, right? So you need to be communicating properly from the beginning what you're looking for. We've got a strong culture, a tight culture. We want to improve upon that. We're doing a chief revenue officer role today where the person in the role is retiring next year. And, and they're saying, like, we, we want this person to come in and be comfortable in their shoes that they don't need early wins because we've got a good staple set, but we also don't want this person to have to meet sponsors by themselves. We'd rather the incumbent introduce them to sponsors as an example. So like how great that you can have that kind of parachute for the exiting leader, but also ramp up period for the new leader. Not every organization has that luxury. Sometimes someone resigns and gives you two weeks or, or two hours. And so you might, not, you might not have been prepared for it, but being very vocal about what you expect in this person on the front end. And then, and then it's an interview process, right? Understanding the person's background. We're big advocates for behavioral interviewing. So getting examples of times when people have done things before that's transferable. So even, even simply, tell me about a time where you took over somebody else's team and you were able to bring more success without changing out the team might, might be a good question to ask because you can understand how they 
came in, they won over their, their direct reports and got them excited about a shifting vision, perhaps shifting KPIs, but you didn't have to start all over and, and build back from the ground up because that culture was important. So getting many examples of seeing how they've done other things is key. Reference checks are important. I'm a huge advocate for reference checks. And while every HR article out there will say the person can only say, yes, they worked here and yes or no, we wouldn't hire them again. There's ways we can all be smart and strategic around that. And I did a CRO role recently and the reference said, you oh, this person's great, wonderful. I was like, you're, you're with a huge beer company. How many teams do you sponsor personally? Not the business, you personally. And I think the number is like 32. I said 32. So you know 32 chief revenue officers then that you work with? Yes. Where would you rank this person, one through 32, in quality of chief revenue officers you work with? <laughs> kind of an unfair question, but I wanted to know that, right? Yeah. And, uh, and when they said rank them 31st at a 32nd, I was like, well, that's fine. My client's a 31st at a 32nd type of club. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> they, they raved about the person and were able to, to give me some context and share why they felt that way and getting to ask them how they've seen them manage their team and shift. Culture is so important. It needs to be long-term sustainable when it's working well. A lot of big organizations have cultural values and systems set in place, and they're always hiring to those and, and checkpoints to make sure it happens. And to me, Chris, culture's two big items. It's philosophy. Hey, we, we believe in sharing and collaboration and kindness, but, but it's also structure and, and how businesses operate. So you might hire a bunch of collaborative people, but the sales teams in the basement and the marketing teams on the second floor, and they're not expected to go and talk to each other before something goes out the door. So while they wanted to collaborate, there, there wasn't a system in place that said, there, here's a checkpoint, here's, here's a check and balance to make sure you work well together. So you, the organizations do really need to make sure it's both that philosophy that they're hiring for, but also someone who can work inside a structure that, that causes that collaboration. Yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing. And, and you know, in the sports industry, when, you know, I'm biased, I've been in the sports industry for 20 years. Uh, so, we're, you know, you're working crazy hours and there's eight teams and different the culture and the people are, are so important and to be able to be friends and, and to treat it as a, a lifestyle versus, you know, that job that you're, you know, you're going to nine to five um, organizational culture is so, so important. So I, I, I loved, uh, I love the answer on that one. So I'd like to wrap just with uh, my, my CEO always says that Paul will constantly share. He said, your competitors can copy everything you do, except for your people and your culture. It's the only things they can't copy. So yeah. how do you make sure you have the right people? the right culture and ensure things like intellectual property you, for a while, right? You might be able to get ahead of there, but they can, they can create great products too. So how do you make sure you have the best people and the best culture? Because that's really what you compete against. We've known that forever on the ice hockey rink, right? We've known that forever on the basketball court. We've recognized that. I think oftentimes sports businesses didn't view it that way. You're lucky to work here in sports. And, and yes, we are very lucky to work here. But there's lots of organizations, good talent would be lucky to work at, and who would also say we're lucky to have you. And, and so for the business side to recognize we need to be a place the top talent wants to work is essential because that's how they keep them longer and they, they achieve more. Yeah, I, li I like that a lot. I like that a lot. So a couple, um, you know, a lot of the primary audience of uh, who's going to view this are, you know, fourth year marketing students or, or uh, business students. So I'd like to just talk a little bit about, um, you, you know, your role in or your company's role, in either placing, you know, people that are in their second, third job or maybe younger in their career, get into some, you know, what's, in, what's important, you know, what is, what does Nolan Partners look for uh, in, a, in a young sports executive? So um, we've had a few people and, and, you know, something that's important to me, I'll use the term, uh, that Kathy Carter used actually last, the last time she used the term intellectual curiosity and how important that was and, and the ability to demonstrate and, and to always be curious as you're moving through your career. You know, is there, is there anything else, things point out that uh, should be on the top of mind of the emerging sports executive? I love Kathy's answer. I think intellectual, pro, uh, intellectual curiosity is huge. Uh, we're all that way as children, as children, we want to know how things work. Spend, spend an afternoon with a four-year-old and they're going to ask you why a thousand times to understand how things operate. And to me, that's the same 
as a business leader, you should be asking why. You should know why things work the way things work. You should you should want to know why systems are the way that they are and, and constantly peeling that back. Toyota, I don't know if they still do it today, but for many years, there was a rule if something broke down, they would have to ask why five times, right? It, it broke down because the, the, the chain snapped. Well, why did the chain snap? Well, it, it wasn't checked every three weeks like it was supposed to be checked every three weeks. Well, why wasn't it checked every three weeks? Well, Chris was sick and Chris was the one who checked it this week. Why was Chris sick? Well, we worked some 12 days in it, right? Like you, you kind of try to get back to where it came from. That, that's an intellectual curious, intellectually curious way of problem solving. Uh, and I do think as an industry, you should constantly be studying who's doing things better than you, how they're doing it, how they're implementing it, how they're succeeding. So I, I love that answer. I'm the biggest advocate for being a lifelong learner. Too many people get their college degree and they say, I'm done learning. Um, I, I listen to multiple podcasts every single week and my podcasts are business related podcasts. That it's not me hearing two people talk about the basketball game last night. Uh, I'm constantly reading books from other industries, right? Not, not just books about sports leaders, but books from other spaces. And that's important to me because I, I realize there's a next generation who's just learned four years straight. It's when was the last time I learned? It, it should be as common and frequently. And, and you learn to get a job, but the next job you should be learning to earn that job as well and, and not stopping. So that's a, that's a big piece for me. I think too many people under index on work ethics. Uh, I, I don't really think work-life balance exists. I think in sports, you're working in an industry that is part of your life. You love it. And, and when I go to a football match at 7 p.m., I'm not thinking I'm working from 7 until 11 when I leave. I'm thinking I enjoyed that, right? So my work and my life are, are connecting with one another and, and bringing those together. But you look across this industry, the person who works the hardest goes much farther in their career than the person who's entitled or thinks they get there. You look across the top athletes, everyone will say Tom Brady's the hardest worker they've ever met. Michael Jordan, known for showing up at the basketball court before everybody else. Uh, you see some of the rehab programs people like Kevin Durant will do. It's more than the average person. So yes, their skill set and capability probably was also at a, at a pinnacle level, but they outworked people. And, and you've got to find balance in that because what's a successful career if you lose all your friends and family as a result of it, right? So you need, you need to find balance in that. But, but given your all and, and choosing to, to be a top performer in all areas of your life as best as you can, I think it's important and constantly measuring in. Let's say that if I'm allowed to have one more, uh, self-awareness is really important. Many people aren't self-aware. I, I encourage my team all the time to say, imagine somebody else walks into our room right now who do they think is the most authoritative expert on this topic by how people are sitting, by how they're looking, by what they're wearing? It's just the reality. Pe people do that. I'm not saying they should, but they do. Uh, are, are what you're say is what you're saying being received, how you're trying to say it? And, and that's important. Performers do that all the time, right? Actors would do that all the time. Public speakers all the time. Did my joke land the way it was intended to land? It was written funny. Did I say it funny? <laughs> Did I have the right setup for it? And I, I do think it's very important in any leadership role, and big companies train this to say, are you, are you giving off a sense of confidence? Do you know what you're doing? What's, what's your backdrop, right? Just all those types of things so that you're, you are presenting yourself in the best version of yourself. It's, it's amazing how the lifelong learner in that journey has changed over, over the years. You know, when I started in the industry, it was, you know, what book did you read? What book did you read? What book did you read? Now it's, whether it's the podcast or did you, did you, sure. were you on that, invited to that session on Clubhouse? I mean, Clubhouse is a really interesting one where you've got these drop-in cool. sessions where, where you're learning, you're learning about whatever different topic that, that is curious to you. And, you know, that, that one's, that one's phenomenal as well. There's so many different ways to learn and to explore now than, yeah. than, uh, than the past. So there's, there's loads of information out there. Um, okay. Hey Chris, I'm, so, I'm a big believer that you start to love what you spend a lot of time in. And especially, especially as you see yourself get good at it. M many athletes, they're not playing their first sport, right? It's not, it might not be their first love. They spent a lot of time in it and they grew to love it because they started to see 
the impact of that, and they, they had that response mechanism, if you will. Um, it, it's, it's so true. Marriage experts will tell you, parenting experts will tell you to do the activities of love, and you will start to feel that love. You, you might not be inspired in your heart to go bring flowers home to your wife today, but just go do it because logically it makes sense. And then watch how you actually enjoy and feel love as you give those flowers yeah. to your wife, right? It's like those yeah, yeah. actions have, have huge effects on, on our hearts and our minds. Like you can teach yourself to fall in love with learning. So when I'm watching a YouTube video on, on something or I'm listening to a clubhouse on, on a business topic, I've fallen in love with that the same way I probably would have fallen in love years ago watching basketball because I've invested time into it. So it might not be easy day one for people who are trying to become lifelong learners and, and, and invest into that time. But now I, I crave it. Like, oh, I'm so excited. I'm going to learn a, read a book about marketing right now. And that, that almost can sound asinine if, if that's not where your headspace is at today. But you start investing into it and you really will reach a point where you, you look forward to it. You crave it. Absolutely. So this was uh, some awesome insight. We'll finish with a couple fun questions here. Okay. Deal. Let's uh, let's hear about your favorite sporting moment that you've been at live. So I my my two I both of them happened to take place in Manchester, England. I did go to the Manchester Derby. I think it was 2019. It might have been early 2020, and that was so special. That's a bucket list for someone like me. My favorite sporting memory is going to a UFC fight in Manchester. Uh, it was Henderson and Bisping. What made it so special was the chaos that it really was on my body, right? I'm, I am jet lagged as can be over there. UFC fights take place on Vegas time or, or New York time, whatever you want to say, but on Vegas time. So the first card, the undercard, it started at either 11 a.m. or midnight, the first fight. The main event was at 4 p.m. or 4 a.m. So 4 a.m. is the main event. We got out of there, I don't know, 5.30, 6, 6.30, just exhausted, no sleep. Some people were probably smart enough to have slept as they went there, but we didn't, we didn't have that luxury. We weren't staying in Manchester. And I show up at the train station. It's about a 20 minute walk from Manchester Arena, if, at least with how tired my legs were at that time. And Chris, there were probably 8,000, 9,000 people mostly bigger guys sleeping on the floor of the train station, snuggling up with each other because it was cold. Nobody brought blankets. And the first train didn't leave until eight or 9 AM that morning. And that you would have thought it was the apocalypse. Like I just freeze in this moment. Like when am I ever going to see 8,000 plus people again, mostly big rugby looking guys yeah. all sleeping on the floor of the train station. Hilarious. That's how much we love sport. We do really irrational things. Uh, and I will never forget that image. That was awesome. That's awesome. And then uh, last, last one here. So you're, you're still young. You got a lot of, a lot of time left in your career, but when it's all said and done, what is going to make you proud? What, what do you hope to be remembered for when it's all said and done? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's an awesome question. I, I hope my colleagues, whether they work with me or, or they happen to be a consulting client, they become the best versions of themselves through me being in their lives. So that is, that's personally recognizing we're humans. We're not only workers and, and they have successful personal lives, but equally that they're thriving in their careers, whatever path they wanted to take in their career. Not everyone wants to be a CEO and needs to be a CEO. And I don't want everyone to measure their success by how many rungs they climbed in a ladder. But, but my hope, I, I had this moment of realization recently, Chris, where we become like the five people that we spend our most time with. Um, I'm, I'm one of those five people for other people. And so like, am I the version of myself that other people are going to end up becoming like? And so I think that puts a lot of responsibility on, on myself and on ourselves to say, okay, am, am I the best version that I can be of myself? Am I trying to improve myself every day? Because uh, my, my hope is people have really successful, personal lives, that they, that they do well, they stay healthy, they're kind, full of integrity. Uh, that, that matters the most. And, and at the same time in business that they're, they're making a real impact. They're enjoying it. They're kind to others and they're spreading that elsewhere. We can be competitive. We can be commercial. We can, we can knock out the competition and be quality human beings while we do that. And that's what I would look for. 
you know, a lot of leaders in our time will be remembered for uh, what happened over the last 12 months and, and how they dealt with adversity through this pandemic. Um, and, and uh, you know, a lot of them have done a great job, some, some not, so, not so much. And, and, uh, but this is a key moment for, for leadership. And um, for yeah. me, you look around and you, know, you look back the last 12 months and you can see those great leaders and, and what they've done. So from a reflection standpoint, uh, I think it's been an important time you know, around the globe, uh, from a leadership standpoint, that'll, this is a key moment in, in, in our lives. Um, and hopefully we've all had health, you know, to the best of our ability through all of this and, and we persevere much, much longer, but, um, yeah, you know, ton, tons of lessons in leadership over this, this last 12 months. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, much appreciated. And, uh, eventually look forward to seeing you in person, uh, again, whenever, whenever we're allowed to, right. Deal. I look forward to it as well. Thank you for having me. Such an honor.